Dear students, welcome to the next lecture on stress distribution in soils. This is the fifth in the series. In the last four lectures, we had seen several important concepts and methods relating to stress distribution in soils. In particular, we spent a lot of time in understanding what theory of elasticity is and how it has been ingeniously applied for determination of stresses in soils. Today, we will proceed further. We will review briefly and add a few more points, cover a few more aspects of whatever we have already seen and also see how to apply this with the help of a few examples. So, the scope of this lecture is going to be a, an extension of what we saw in the last lecture. If you look at this slide, in the last lecture, we covered specifically speaking the method of determining stress distribution beneath a strip load, a rectangular area and a circular area. Now, what we shall do today is we will go through quickly and also add a few more points to our understanding of the effect of point loads, line loads and strip loads and also the effect under a rectangular area, a circular area. In particular, we will make use of a table called the Numox influence table and we will see how best it can be applied for determination of stress distribution in soils. So, let us go ahead with a review, a quick review of some of the basic points that we had covered in the last lecture and also see additional details of whatever we had seen last time. Next slide shows in brief in a nutshell what a point load does. You remember in the last lecture we discussed that the first and foremost contribution to stress distribution was the, by Businesk for determining stresses under a concentrated load. If there is a surface ground surface, if there is a concentrated load which is also called a point load, then Using Business theory, we can calculate the vertical stress at any point P. As you know, as we have discussed several times, it is the vertical stress which is of primary interest to us. The scheme that is being used can be understood from this. This is the coordinate system, this is the load, this is the element, the so called parallelepiped enveloping the point at which we want the stress. The equation for vertical stress as given by Businesk is sigma z equal to 3 p z cube by 2 pi r square plus z square to the power of 5 by 2, where all the coordinate axis and the coordinates are already mentioned in this figure. P is the load. Now, as we saw last time, this was very cleverly expressed in the form of p upon z square into a constant factor which in turn is known as the influence factor. You note here that this p is the load applied and z square has units of area where z is the depth. So, p by z square is having the units of stress and this multiplied by a non dimensional quantity namely the influence factor gives you the stress at any point. So, this is as far as point load is concerned. We even examined the application of this with the help of a small problem. This is a table which gives you in detail how the influence factor itself varies. Since this influence factor depends upon the coordinate ratio r upon z, I mean that is understandable the influence factor has to be different for different points. The load remaining same and fixed at one point as you move over the medium in the lateral and the vertical direction downward at every point you will have a different stress and therefore, a different value of influence factor. And what is more convenient than a table which gives you all these influence factor values in a systematic way and that is what we have here. If we have a point load for vertical stresses the influence values for different r by z starting from 0 and going up to a value of say 2.9 is given like this. And you can continue the, with this, you can go for higher and higher values of r upon z, but this is an illustrative table which is not exhaustive. 
and uh, in, in practice very often these ratios which are depicted in this table are found to be quite sufficient. So, this table serves as a basis for us for calculating stress at any point due to a point load. Now, consider a few more additional points which we had not discussed earlier regarding the effect of a concentrated load. Now, we know that whenever a, when a concentrated load is applied, it is going to get dissipated according to some rule given by the Businesk theory. We saw in fact, that it is varying inversely as the square of the distance as we go downward. Now, it is of interest in practice to know what will be the total load that is transferred at any depth z and over what area. Suppose, this is the area over which the load is getting dispersed, then what is the quantum of load or what is the total load that is coming over this area where this is length and let us say this is the breadth. It is very interesting that this has been computed and it is in fact found to be very similar to the reverse problem which we had seen last time. That is, if a rectangular area is loaded uniformly, then what will be the stress at any point at the depth? This is the converse of that. If a load is applied at the surface, what will be the component of the load at a on over a rectangular area at some known depth? Let us see this a little more in detail. Suppose, this is the load and this is the area this rectangular area which is shown here, this is the area over which we want the total load that is transferred and what fraction of p is transferred here. In order to do this, we can take a small element d x d y, find out the stress at the center of this by Businesk theory by the same equation which we saw in the last slide, the equation meant for stress at any point below a concentrated load. This element being very small, we can take this stress that we get at the center of this to be the stress on this area uniformly distributed. So, we get the total load on this elemental area as the stress at the center multiplied by d x d y. It is very simple now to get the total load corresponding to the same depth over a rectangular area by simply integrating this over this entire area of dimensions say 4 2 times a in this direction and 2 times b in this direction. What you see here is one quadrant of the rectangular area has been isolated. Now, you also must notice that the concentrated load is passing through the center of the rectangular area. Therefore, the load that we are going to calculate over this rectangular area will correspond to an area whose center is directly below the load. If we have the total load in this small elemental area, we can integrate this over an area given by dimension A and dimension B. And then, since all other quadrants are also symmetrical in relation to this particular quadrant, after having obtained the load over one quadrant, by simply multiplying it by 4, we can get the total load over the entire rectangular area that makes the computations much simpler. So, let us see if h is the depth at which we have a rectangular area and d x d y is a small element and a and b are the dimensions of one quadrant whose corner is directly below the load p, how to compute the total load over this area a b. Here are the details. The expression for stress at any point is the same expression which we had been seeing all along. The total load at any point over a very small elemental area d x d y would be sigma of sigma z that is the total load over a small elemental area d x d y and it can be obtained by integrating the expression for stress sigma z over the limits 0 to b and 0 to a where a and b are the dimensions of the rectangular area. Now, if we do integrate this then divide this total loads divided by p, we will find that this integration gives us 
an expression like this that is we have simply substituted sigma z in place here. Now, this is the basic expression which gives what fraction of the load p is transmitted to any area at a depth z. Now, if we proceed further this integration can be actually performed and you will then get that the fraction of load transmitted over an area is equal to 0.25 minus this term minus this term. This is a very interesting expression and this is known as the Hall's solution. This is an interesting expression in the sense that this becomes something like an influence factor. This is what is known as an influence factor that is what is the load transmitted to any area for a given load capital P and what is interesting is further h is the depth a and b are the horizontal dimensions and if we non dimensionalize all the distances here by dividing throughout by h then we will have a term called small m which is a upon h one of the dimensions divided by the depth and we will have another term small n which is equal to the other dimension b divided by h and by taking different values of a by h and b by h and substituting in this expression we will be able to find out for a unit load capital P what is the total load transmitted to an area a b and that is nothing but the influence factor. This Hall's solution can be conveniently used to find out the total load transmitted to any depth by a concentrated load. Now, suppose we move on to another instance where a slight modification of this occurs that is here is a rectangular area identical to what we saw earlier only its center is no longer coinciding with the z axis. In the previous case the center of the rectangular area was directly below the load p. Now, here there is a small shift the center of the area is no longer directly under p in such a case we can still apply Hall's solution conveniently imaginatively all that we need to do is to take the area which is having one point directly below capital P. Now, if I draw this additional line G D here then this point intersects the line of action of P and now we can say that our given area whose center is not coinciding with this is in fact equal to two rectangles of dimensions a in one direction b plus c d in the other direction and two more rectangles equal in dimension to 2 a in one direction and d e in the other direction. Which means now that we have divided the given area into four quadrants again two of them are equal the other two are also equal, but different from these two and the concentrated load still passes through the corner of the rectangular area. Which means that the Hall's solution can once again be applied all that we need to do is to remember that the influence value that we will be getting will be as before valid for one quadrant and to get the load over the whole area we will have to find out the influence factor for one quadrant here multiply by 2 and for one quadrant here and multiply by 2 and then add up. So, in short area a b c h which is let us say the area over which we want the load can be expressed as area a b d g whose corner is lying in fact below the concentrated load minus area h c d g whose corner is also lying under the load capital P. So, this way any area including a small part of the total area can be conveniently analyzed for the total load. It is important to remember here that one dimension of the quadrant in the x direction for example, is m which is equal to a upon h and the other dimension is given as small n which is capital B upon h. Since h varies according to the point at which we want the stress the scale a upon h and b by h 
enables us to non dimensionalize these dimensions of the area in such a way that one set of charts that we may be developing for m and n will be useful for all areas at all depths. See for example, the area over which we want the stress can be easily split up into a number of parts and by applying the principle of superposition we can get the total load either by subtraction or by addition depending upon the location of the center of the area. Now, let us pass on to line loads and we will recollect that a, a line load produces a stress which is given by this expression. This again is merely an integration of the expression for a concentrated load over a long length. Further, we can extend this to a strip load, line load expression can be integrated over an area like that shown here and we can get an expression for the fraction of the stress as a function of the load per unit area small p and this is the expression in which we have two angles beta and delta which are marked here in this diagram, this key diagram we have the angle beta and delta marked. So, if we know these two angles, if we know the load small p per unit area, we can calculate the stress at any typical point capital P at any known depth z due to a strip load. And once again as we did in the case of point load, we can develop a chart of influence values. The advantage is that once we put in the non dimensional coordinates or dimensions z upon b by 2 and x upon b by 2, we can get a chart which will be useful for any such area, any such strip loading for any depth irrespective of the dimensions. So, this table for example, gives you values ranging from z upon b by 2 from 0 to 2.5 and x upon b by 2 varying from 0 to 3. It is possible to enlarge this table and include values higher than these as well, but in most practice this range is sufficient. Now, we also saw in the last lecture that if we have two line loads, we can still employ the same influence factor chart that we saw in the previous slide. All that we need to do is to remember that we are still using theory of elasticity. We have to note that Businet's theory is based on linear theory of elasticity and as I explained in one of my earlier lectures, as long as the theory of elasticity that we use assumes a linear relationship between stress and strain that is modulus is constant, the principle of superposition is always valid. That is the effect of two loads is the same as effect of their sum. That is what we have in order to find out the total effect of two loads P 1 and P 2 all that we need to do is to find out the effect of P 1 separately, P 2 separately and add. And if we now proceed further and see how to evaluate stress beneath a rectangular area of finite dimensions L and B. This is different from a strip loading in the sense that in a strip loading the length L is very large compared to the other dimension B. Here L and B are of comparable dimensions and therefore, this is called a rectangular area. Now, suppose we want to find out the stress at any point beneath this as we saw in one of our earlier lectures, the value of sigma z can be obtained by taking a small element, finding out the stress in this element and then integrating it over the entire area. If we do that, we find that the stress at any point p sigma z can be expressed as the unit load p per unit area p per kilometer square which is applied over this rectangular area into an influence value i m n, where m and n once again represent non dimensional distances or lengths. In this case m stands for b upon z, n stands for l upon z. Since l and b are relative, m and n are also relative and as you will see in the charts which we had seen earlier as well as which are going to come 
after this which are going to follow m and n are interchangeable it is just that they are two non dimensional sides of the same rectangle. Going further this chart which also we briefly looked at last time gives you the influence values in graphical form. What does it give? Suppose this is the rectangular area this chart gives you the influence value for calculating stress at a point A beneath the corner of this rectangular area. The dimensions are m times z and n times z whatever be the actual dimensions they can always be expressed as the non dimensional m z and n z. Here is this chart known as the Fadham's chart which is based on the equation for stress which is written in the form p into i m n and this shows m along the x axis i f the influence factor along the y axis and there are several curves here corresponding to different n values. So, all that you need to know is what is m corresponding to the z at which we want the stress. See remember that this area remains the same its dimensions are l and b depending upon the depth at which we want the stress these dimensions can be repeatedly expressed as m z and n z the actual absolute magnitudes of the dimensions remain the same but the non dimensional values will be m z and n z where m and n will go on varying depending upon the z depth at which we want the stress. The advantage is when z becomes the scale factor one single graph showing m and n and corresponding i f can be used for any depth. This is what one can employ to get the influence value at a and that multiplied by the stress per unit area here will give you what is the effect of this whole area what is the stress corresponding to this entire loaded area at a point like a. Now, if we have an area which is larger than this we can always divide that into quadrants once again in such a way that a corner of the quadrant is always above the point at which we want the stress that is what I mean here in this diagram. Suppose, this is the total area this is the coordinate axis x y these are the dimensions a and b this is the unit load small p per area unit area. What is important is that the point at which we want the stress is directly below the center and therefore, we employ the expression that we had derived for a point lying below the corner of a rectangle repeatedly for each one of the four rectangles into which we can divide the given area. We can also modify this slightly in case we have an area whose center is not above the point at which we want the stress that we shall see shortly. Here Businesk had derived the expression sigma z by p equal to this for the stress at any depth z due to the uniformly distributed load small p over a rectangular area. This is nothing but a different way of writing this same expression. This equation which we have here where we have expressed sigma z in the form of a an applied load p and the influence factor i this again is identical to that just represented in a different way by Newmark. So, both of them are based on business solution, but they have been represented in a different way in order to non dimensionalize them and facilitate calculation of influence factor. So, once again if we express a upon h as m and b upon h by n we have a, a table from which we can calculate the influence factor and incidentally as I mentioned a little while ago whether it is calculating the stress at a point below due to a uniform load on the surface or finding the total load at depth over a rectangular area due to a concentrated load at the top they are reverse of each other the influence coefficient still remains the same. So, given the same influence coefficient chart we can solve both problems. So, the Hall's solution which we saw for computing load over a rectangular area at depth due to a point load on the surface and the Newmark solution which we saw in the last slide for stress at a point as a fraction of the applied unit load p 
a uniformly distributed one UDL, the same influence factor I f is valid for both problems. This I f can be computed therefore, either from the expression given by Hall or from the expression given by Newmark or from the expression given by Busnesk's theory. In effect now, we have therefore, three different forms in which the influence factor is given. In one case, we have influence factor corresponding to load on a rectangular area due to a concentrated load. In the other, we have a graphical representation of the influence factor as a function of m and n and here we have a table again which gives the influence factor as a function of m and n where m is a upon h and n is b upon h or vice versa. It all depends upon how we look at the area, which dimension is taken as length and which dimension is taken as b. So, it does not really matter the influence factor remains the same irrespective of whether we take this as m or this as m or and vice versa. In this chart, we have a number of influence factor values given for m ranging from 1 to 10 or 0 0.1 to 10 and n ranging from also 0 0.1 to 10 or even infinity. This table is complete in itself, it covers almost all possible cases of m and n. This has been developed by Newmark or based on the Newmark solution which we saw in the previous slide and it is an excellent tool for solving stress distribution problems. We can apply this influence value table to a rectangular area irrespective of whether the desired point is below the center or away from the center. Because in either case, we can divide the given loaded area into either equal areas or into unequal areas. And in both cases, we can divide the given total area in such a way that the desired point lies below the point of intersection of the smaller area subdivisions. The reason as I have mentioned earlier is the expressions that we have for calculating stress are all based on a point lying below directly below the corner of a rectangular area. We can proceed further to understand stress distribution in, a, in the case of loads over a circular footing or circular foundation. We had seen this also in the last lecture. The idea of presenting them again here now is to show that influence tables, influence charts are all available and they can be advantageously used for computing the stress at any given point or the total load over any area at any depth. See here, this is the expression for influence factor for stress at any point A below a loaded area which is carrying a uniform intensity of loading small p. This again has been solved by the same business theory. We take a small element here which has a length d r whose other dimension is r d theta, where d theta is the small angle. Just as we had taken a rectangular element d x d y and integrated over the whole given loaded area. Here again, we can take this small element and integrate it for theta varying from 0 to 360 and small r varying from 0 to the diameter or radius capital R and thus we can get the stress at any point A directly below the center of the circle. So, this expression that we have here is valid for computing stress at any point directly below the center of a uniformly loaded circular area. In case we want to do this with the help of charts, here is a non dimensional chart. This shows sigma z by p and z upon r. Why we take z upon r is here we have in the expression for sigma z upon p the term r upon z. Since r is a constant, it is convenient to express the table or the chart or the graph in terms of 
a quantity z upon r where z is the variable and r is a factor which is constant and which helps to non dimensionalize the depth z. Here we have this non dimensionalized graph showing vertical stress versus depth below the center of a uniformly loaded circular area. So, this shows now for example, when z equal to 0 when we consider a point directly below the center of the foundation on the surface of the soil you find that sigma z is exactly equal to small p. So, this is the maximum value of stress ratio that is possible and as we go deeper and deeper sigma z upon p goes on decreasing and at about 6 the sigma upon r when it reaches a value of approximately 6 we find that sigma z upon p reaches a very very low value which means that in practice the effect of any load small p is maximum at the top indicating that the stress at the surface is very high and could be equal to of the load applied intensity of loading applied and virtually at a depth of 5 to 6 times the radius of the loaded area the influence of the load p is vanishing practically vanishing. That means, that this is the depth over which the stresses really act the loaded area on the surface that here does not seem to have much influence beyond a depth of 6 times the radius capital R. This can be also plotted the same whatever we saw in the previous table or what whatever we saw in the graph can also be plotted or can also be presented in the form of a table. Here we have z by r values ranging from 0 to 5 and corresponding sigma z by p or i f. What we need to notice or pay attention to and remember here is that when depth is 0 stress is highest that is it is equal to p that means the influence factor is 1. And uh, as we go deeper at a depth equal to 5 times the radius the influence factor drops to 0 0.0571 compared to what it was on the surface this is a very very small value and uh, again this table indicates that beyond a depth of about 5 times the radius the influence factor and therefore, the stress induced due to a surface load is not high may be even negligible. Now, here we have another table which is a representation of the same information that we had seen in the case of the circular area in the previous table and chart that is in this table and in this chart whatever information we have that is the stress ratio due to an applied load p over a circular loaded area and the depth z by r non dimensional. This table also contains the same information, but here it is slightly differently presented. We find here we have got the influence factor against which the ratio r upon z has been presented. Whereas, the previous table showed us at what depth what will be the influence factor. This table gives us what influence factor would correspond to what depth and this also has its great relevance as you will see where this value has been successfully used to generate a chart by Newmark which is universally applicable to all loaded areas. This contains 9 rather 11 values we can always also introduce additional intermediate values or values beyond 1 in order to complete this table and make it exhaustive, but it is unlikely to have a value of sigma z beyond 1 because the stress induced cannot exceed the load applied which is small p. So, sigma z by p or i f can only vary from 0 to 1. On the other hand r upon z can vary from 0 that is r equal to 0 means surface to r equal to infinity or r by z equal to infinity. This covers a very wide range of r by z and stress ratio and this is more or less adequate for solving any stress distribution problem where we have circular loaded areas. Now, let us take a look at 
an example of application of the principle we saw so far. This example is something which we have already discussed, but in the light of what we have learnt additionally today in order to ensure continuity and better understanding let us take a look at the same example once again. Now, what is this example? This example says compute the vertical stress determine the vertical stress on what on a horizontal plane. Where is the horizontal plane located? At a depth of 12 meters and where what is the location in the lateral direction? It is located at a depth of 12 meters on the line of action of the concentrated load. What is the concentrated load? 800 kilo newtons and how does it act? It acts normally on the upper surface of a semi infinite elastic isotropic and homogeneous continuum. That means, if we were to draw a diagram to represent this problem, we will get the same thing that we had analyzed in the last class that is here is the ground surface and at a depth of 12 meters there is again a horizontal plane and we want the vertical stress on a horizontal plane at a depth of 12 meters on the line of action of a concentrated load. So, if this is a concentrated load and this is its line of action at a depth of 12 meters at this point on a rectangular area or a horizontal plane we want the stress. The concentrated load is given on the surface as 800 kilo newtons and it is acting normally on the upper surface of a semi infinite elastic isotropic and homogeneous continuum which means that this satisfies the requirements of theory of elasticity and we can simply apply Businesk's theory to calculate the stress sigma z here. The method will be this being a simpler problem relatively simple problem the method is to simply take the expression for sigma z which is 3 p by z square etcetera and that is what we have done. The solution can also be attempted by using the expression sigma z is equal to p by z square into influence factor and so we have here the influence factor. Influence factor is determined from a table which we had seen a little while earlier for point loading. There for r by z equal to 0 we saw that influence factor is 0.4775. Let us take a quick look here we have the point load and corresponding to r by z here r by z equal to 0 due to a point load we have i f equal to 0.478 which is what we had found and used in the this is what we had used in the computation here as well. We had 0.478 a more precise value is 0 0.47745 and that is a, that has been used it is preferable to use an i f value which is quite precise rather than use the values which are given in the table. Therefore, wherever it is possible or feasible to use the expression for stress directly and wherever it is not necessary to use the table or the chart it is preferable to compute the influence factor more rigorously. It may be of importance in certain instances in, in certain problems. In problems where it is not going to make a significant difference we can as well use the graph or the table of influence values and compute the stress. So, here influence coefficient multiplied by p by z square is the stress that is 2.653 kilo Newton per meter square due to a point load of 800 kilo Newtons p is 800 kilo Newtons and z is 12 meters. Take another example this example relates to the previous one and that is the reason why I once again went through the previous example although we had seen it in an earlier occasion on an earlier occasion when we were talking about point loads and uh, the method to compute stress below a point load 
using theory of elasticity. So, here now suppose we once again consider problem or example 1. This question says determine the total load on a rectangular area. The dimensions of the rectangular area is given as 8 meters by 4 meters. We shall take 8 meters as the dimension along the x axis and 4 meters as the dimension along the y axis because that is the way normally length and breadth are taken with respect to our coordinate axis. The depth is as before same 12 meters and what is additionally given a very significant piece of information use important point that is the center of the rectangular area lies directly below the concentrated load. The center of the rectangular area is directly below the concentrated load. Therefore, it is conforming to the standard case where we have the concentrated load here, we have the rectangular area here at a depth z or at a depth h as the depending upon the notation we use and the center of that area is directly below p. So, we want to calculate the load over this entire area due to the concentrated load p. All that we need to do is to know what is A, what is B, what is H, apply Hall's solution and the influence factor table prepared suggested based on Hall's solution. That will give us the load over an area A upon B where one corner of that area is directly below P. Now, if we apply the same principle or the same solution to another area here also A upon B whose corner is also directly below P and so also for a third quadrant and the fourth quadrant we will find that the total load on this dimension A B and the total load on each one of these other quadrants all together will add up to the total load on the entire rectangular area. See here this was the expression for sigma z using this expression for a small elemental area d x dy we get the expression for the total load dividing it by capital P after substituting this in this we have part of the load out of the load applied is equal to this at any depth z. The whole solution if we were recollect once again is this. So, in this now if I substitute A upon H as m small m, B upon H as small n and get the value of influence factor corresponding to this which is nothing but the ratio of this. Multiplying it by capital P I can get the total load on one quadrant multiplied by 4 I will get the load on all the four quadrants together. So, Hall's solution can be used or it is the same thing as using the Newmark table which was derived for a uniformly distributed load and its effect at depth both will give the same result. Now, the solution to this particular example is P is 800 kilo newtons that is part of the data. The length of the rectangle over which we want the total load total length is 8 meters which means one quadrant A has a length L equal to or a length A equal to 4 meters. Similarly, one dimension of the quadrant in the y direction which is half of this that is 2 meters and the depth is 12 meters. So, we can either use Fadham's chart or the influence coefficient tables. Suppose we use the Fadham's chart for a change or for illustration then m which is the ratio of a upon h would be 4 upon the depth 12 that is 0.333 and b upon h or small n would be half of this that is 2 divided by the depth 12 that is 0.1667. Now, if I enter Fadham's chart for m is equal to 0.333 and n equal to 0.167 let us do that we have m is equal to 0.33, m is equal to 0.33 along this and n is equal to 0.167 that is somewhere here. So, our influence value will be somewhere here. So, let us see what that influence value is. 
it turns out to be 0 0.024. This means that the total load on the 8 by 4 meter area is going to be 4 times whatever value we have got here for 1 quadrant that is 4 into 0 0.024 into the load applied that is 800. This means 76.8 kilo Newtons is what the rectangular area carries at that depth of h equal to 12 meters. Let us say this is approximately 80 that means, at 12 meters depth the load over the entire rectangle becomes virtually one tenth of the load applied at the surface. The total load carried at a depth of 12 meters is just one tenth or even a little less than that compared to the load applied which is 800 kilo Newtons. That means, uh, for all practical purposes this concentrated load has an influence up to a depth of about 12 meters. Beyond that its effect is not that significant. Let us take one more example. This example is an extension of the previous example number 2. So, now here what is asked is what will be the load once again on a rectangular area and in fact, the same rectangular area of 8 meters by 4 meters dimension, but its center now has coordinates 6 to 12 meters with respect to the point of action of the concentrated load. If you remember the previous example, the dimensions were 8 by 4 meters, the depth was 12 and the center of the rectangle was below the concentrated load directly, which means the coordinates of the center would have been half of the length 8 that is 4, x coordinate is 4, y coordinate will be half of the y dimension means 2 meters, the depth was 12. So, we had the center at a point 4 to 12, whereas now we have the center at a point 6 to 12 the rectangular area is once again 8 meters by 4 meters that remains the same. So, now how do we find out the load on this same area even though its center is no longer under the concentrated load. Here it is this is a plan view let us say a b c d of dimensions 8 meters by 4 meters is our desired area over which we want the load. This is at the depth 12 meters the center or the point directly below the load is let us say O, then the center of this 8 by 4 area is at 6 meters from O in plan that is already given in, in the statement of the problem, which means now effectively we have one rectangle small a capital B capital C small b, another area small a capital A capital D small b and our own original given area capital A B C D. Since we want the load on the capital A B C D and since our method enables us to calculate load only for quadrants or areas whose one corner is below the applied load. What we need to do now is to find out the total load over entire area small a b c b and subtract from that the load carried by small a capital A capital D B. Now, this is possible because both these sets of rectangles have one corner directly below O. Now, if we do that we find that for the large area A is 10 meters B is 2 meters and so we have m equal to 0 0.833 n equal to 0 0.167 influence factor equal to 0 0.042 and the load is 67.2 kilo Newtons. For the small additional area which has been added is A 2 meters, B 2 meters, M is 2, N is 2 upon 12 both are 0 0.167. The influence factor is 0 0.012 and the corresponding load is 19.2. Here you must note that we have multiplied the influence factor by 2 and the applied load 800. The reason why we have multiplied by 2 is there are 2 rectangles which constitute this area. By subtracting 19.2 from 67.2 we get 48 which is the total load carried by the remaining area A B C D. So, now with all this in this lecture 
we have gone into sufficient depth and details and done a quick review of how to compute stresses due to point line and strip loads and also gone a little deeper into the use of influence table or the Fadham's chart to find out stresses beneath a rectangular area or a circular area. We shall proceed further and in one lec uh, lecture we shall be covering subsequently a little more about Newmark's influence chart and its application to rectangular, circular and areas of other shapes as well. What I have mentioned here is slightly different from what we have seen in today's lecture. What we are going to see in the next lecture is Newmark's influence chart, which is a graphical or a diagrammatic representation of influence values. What we have used today is a tabulation of the influence values. What we are going to see in the next class, the Newmark's influence chart is a very ingenious way of developing a, a chart or a diagram, which helps us to compute the stress due to any area rectangular, circular what not. So, with this I will conclude today's lecture, we shall meet again later. Thank you.